Gospel according to Mark, the first chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. Now after John was arrested, Jesus came to Galilee, proclaiming the good news of God and saying, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe in the good news. As Jesus passed along the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and his brother Andrew casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And Jesus said to them, follow me and I will make you fish for people. And immediately they left their nets and followed him. As he went a little farther, he saw James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John, who were in their boat mending the nets. Immediately he called them, and they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired men and followed him. And this is the gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise to you, O Christ. Christ. Please be seated. When my sister Helen was a teenager, she had a real talent for getting caught. <laughs> Not that she did more mischief than anyone else in the family. She was just lousy at hiding it. One time, I remember, she asked Dad if she could borrow the family station wagon. He allowed it with the condition that she only drive in our neighborhood. Now, I really think Helen intended to follow this rule, but you know how it is when you're 17? You're with your friends and the peer pressure ramps up? Before long, she and her friends found themselves cruising along Chicago's Lakeshore Drive, enjoying the summer as they followed that road that skirted Lake Michigan, which was not our neighborhood. She came home on time that night and figured all was well, and that her losing streak of getting away with stuff had finally ended. Dad would never know whether the miles that she put on the car were driven in our neighborhood or not, she reasoned. But what she didn't bargain for was her height. You see, Helen is only an inch or two taller than I am. We tend to stick out. Which is what made it so funny to one of Dad's work friends who remarked to him the next day that he saw the funniest thing. Dad's station wagon was being driven by itself along Lakeshore Drive. Or at least that's what it looked like to him until he got close enough to see just a bit of a head poking up from the dashboard. Busted. As you might guess, that was the last time Helen drove the station wagon for a very long time. The moral of the story is that even when you think you might just get away with something, something or someone will always catch you up. Like with Jonah. Poor Jonah. I love how the passage we read starts out. Did you, did you listen as Dave said? The word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time, which implies that there was a first time. And if you recall what Jonah is famous for, as I bet a lot of you do, you'll know that the first time the word of the Lord came to him, he ran in the other direction. He was told to go to Nineveh and preach repentance or calamity to the people there. <laughs> but that was the last thing that Jonah wanted to do. So he bought fare for a boat headed in the opposite direction. And away he went. Except that a storm came up. And so they started tossing cargo into the sea. And when that didn't work, figuring that Jonah's God was mad at him, which was true, they tossed Jonah into the sea too. And then came the infamous whale that swallowed him up and then eventually vomited him back up. Which brings us to the second time the word of the Lord came to Jonah. Looks like this time God got what God wanted. Jonah dutifully went to Nineveh. Forty days more and Nineveh shall be overthrown, he cried out. Maybe he didn't do it quite like that. Maybe it was more like, Forty days more and Nineveh shall be overthrown. You know, actually, I think maybe it was the first, because he didn't really want to go there in the first place. But in any case, it worked. 
The people repented, and they were spared. Of course, if you read the rest of the story, you'll see that Jonah wasn't too pleased about their change of heart. He wanted them destroyed. Which goes to show you that sometimes you have to answer God's call, even when it's the last thing in the world that you want to do. And your enthusiasm, or lack thereof, won't matter to God. God will do what God will do. Even if you are reluctant, even if you argue with God, even if you book passage on a fast boat going in the opposite direction, God will find you. Meet you exactly where you are and call to you again. Sounds like a lot of pastors call stories actually, doesn't it, Bruce? But it isn't only pastors that God calls, of course. God calls each of us all the time. There are those big calls like careers, vocations, life partnerships. You get it. Whether you acknowledge it or not, God wants to have a role in those decisions. God actually does care how you make your money, spend your time, and who you choose to spend your life with. Yes, those decisions can be and often are made independent of God. But I believe that if you enter into those decisions through the gateway of time spent in prayer, you'll make better decisions. But those are the biggies, the life-changing decisions. Does God care if you cut someone off in traffic when you're late for work? Does God care if you say no to helping out at church because you want to go boating? Does God care if you tell a little fib to your spouse now and then? I don't believe that God micromanages our lives. But I do think that God does actually care about those little decisions that we make every day. God cares, not necessarily because of the little decisions themselves, but more so because of the pattern that they set. You see, our characters are built upon the foundation of those little life decisions. And so even in these seemingly minor decisions, God is calling us, calling us to faithfulness, to compassion, to being disciples of Jesus. Which leads us to the other call story that we heard today. Jesus calling his first disciples. Jesus arrives in Galilee soon after John is arrested. He's walking along the Sea of Galilee and he sees some fishermen, Simon and his brother Andrew. Now, surely Jesus was fishing himself, not for actual fish, but for disciples. He must have had in mind the kind of people that he was looking for to train to tell the good news. So, as God did with Jonah, Jesus goes exactly where he knows his would-be prophets would be found. Now, as an aside, I wonder why he thought of fishers first. Certainly people who make their living off the sea know a lot about patience, peril, and persistence, which are good things to know about if you're going to be Jesus' disciple. But anyway, he goes where he knows he will find his fishers, and he issues his call to them in language they could understand. Or could they? Follow me, and I will make you fish for people, he tells them. Yes, they understood fishing, but for people? Which brings me to another point. When God calls you, you might not immediately understand what it is that God is calling you to. A lot of those of us who ended up as pastors will attest to this. Sometimes we experience call waiting, where we think God is calling us, but we feel we have to put off answering it until something specific happens. Or for some of us, it's more like call forwarding, where we know God has actually called us to ordain ministry, but instead we answer a less committed call. Like, I don't know, volunteering to bake brownies for the church bake sale. Now, don't get me wrong, brownies are certainly one of God's greater gifts to humanity. 
but the commitment it takes to bake them isn't quite as involved as the commitment to go to seminary and become a pastor. And more to the point, it isn't what God actually called you to do, is it? In any case, Jesus issues his call to them, and miracle of miracles, they don't question him. They don't hesitate. Immediately, they left their nets and followed him, scripture says. Same thing happened a little farther down the shore when he called James and John. He invites, they obey. Now, in most things in life, it is good to step back and carefully weigh the pros and cons of any decision. Using our reason and experience can help us make good choices. But here's the one exception to that rule, I think. Because when God invites, obedience is always the right decision. If you know that God is calling you, your decision is already made for you. If he leads you to it, he will see you through it, it said. But, did you notice I said, if you know that God is calling you? <laughs> you see, that's the sticking point for the vast majority of us. Some of us agonize, even for most of our lives, wondering what God wants us to do. <laughs> Should I have gone into business? Or should I have gone to seminary? Should I have become a missionary? Or should I have, you fill in the blank. For my father, it was, should I have become a pediatrician? Or should I obey my mother's wishes and just get a steady manual labor job? In dad's case, although I am sure he would have made a wonderful pediatrician, that steady job allowed him to provide for his wife and seven children, which certainly is a calling from God, I think. But the point is, if we're honest, it can be hard to know what God is calling you to. But here's where I think God lands on that decision. It's not as important to know what God is calling you to as it is to know that God is calling you at all. To know that whatever it is you do in life, you do it to honor and serve God. That is what I think God desires of us. Martin Luther once said, pray like it all depends on God, and when you are done, go work like it all depends on you. And I think if God is calling us to something really specific, God will indeed tell us one way or another. But there are a multitude of ways to serve God, of course. And any lifelong work that we do is our vocation. Again, Martin Luther once described vocations as masks of God, in that the world may see us as doctors, parents, spouses, factory workers, or whatever, but behind the mask, is God working and active in the world through us? And I think that's the essence of what being called is really all about. Because if we can truly believe that whatever we do, God is using us to make the world a little better place, then we won't have to run away from God's call. We won't have to wonder if we should drop everything and head off to a mission field. We won't have to agonize over whether we are truly serving God as a business person instead of as a pastor, youth worker, or anything else. If we can accept that God works through all of us, whatever masks we wear, then we can know that we are being faithful and we can find joy in that. If you feel at times like you might be hearing God calling you to something that you're not really sure of, ask yourself a question. Ask if you are experiencing abundant life, a life of joy and satisfaction that comes from living in God's call for you. If you aren't experiencing that, and I'm not talking about on days when you come home from work after one bad day, I'm talking about patterns here. If you are not experiencing that in general, the peace that comes 
from knowing you are saying yes to God's desire to disciple and send you, then perhaps it's time for you to pay attention to that. Perhaps it's time even for you to pray about it, talk it over with trusted friends, and see what needs changing. The theologian Frederick Buechner said, and I love this quote, the place God calls you to is the place where your deep gladness and the world's deep hunger meet. Let that sink in a little. Where your deep gladness and the world's deep hung hunger meet. Are you running away from your deep gladness or from the world's deep hunger? You might be trying to run away from God if you are. That's never going to give you a good outcome. So during this season that we call Epiphany, sandwiched as it is between Christmas and Lent, why not join with me in letting Christ's starlight shine on your soul, revealing to you the call he wants you to live into? To do that, though, you've got to stop running long enough to see where that star might be pointing you because it's either gonna point you somewhere else or it will enlighten the path that you're already on. Either way, it's always better to stop trying to run away, knowing that eventually God will always catch you. It's always better, in fact, to run not away from God, but with God, passing on the baton to you in the race that is life. And when you do that, I think that you'll find that whatever it is that you do for God, you'll love to tell the story because you'll find that deep gladness that you've been looking for. Amen. And speaking of loving to tell the story, that happens to be our hymn of the day. <laughs> 